uh, but in our area, we don't actually, um, uh, you know, we actually see a lot of evidence of tiger movement. Even our last trip in September, we saw uh, tiger pug marks. Okay. Okay. Shuri, can you start recording? Okay, sure. And, uh, you can you start, Usha? Yeah, once she starts recording, you can start. I've started recording. Let me first uh, wish everyone a very good day. World Environmental Health Day, that is today, 26 September. And uh, we have a very eminent person to talk about ecological restoration, role and contribution of women. When we talk about environment, we all know that the environment plays an important role in a healthy living and existence of life on planet Earth. Earth is a home for different living species, and we are all dependent on the environment for food, air, water, and other needs. Therefore, it is very important for every individual to save and protect our environment. Environmental conservation is the practice of preserving the natural world to prevent it from collapsing as a result of human activities, such as unsustainable agriculture, deforestation, and burning fossil fuels. Ecological restoration, the process of repairing sites in nature whose biological communities and ecosystems have been degraded or destroyed. In many ecosystems, humans have altered local native populations of plants and animals, introduced invasive species, converted natural communities into extractive use, such as uh, agriculture or mining, fouled waters, and degraded soil resources. Ecological restoration focuses on repairing the damage human activities have caused to natural ecosystems and seeks to return them to an earlier state or to another state that is closely related to one unaltered by human activities. Women gave or have given greater priority to protection of and improving the capacity of nature, maintaining farming lands and caring for nature and environment's future. Repeated studies have shown that women have a stake in the environment and this stake is reflected in the degree to which they care about natural resources. In the past, also now, it is seen that they have played a keen role in preventing over-exploitation of forests by profit-making interest. There are incidents where women acted as a shield by struggling to protect grazing lands and forests from troublesome developments like mining. Women also possess valuable traditional knowledge and skills related to natural resource management, agriculture, and conservation. They often have a deep understanding of local ecosystems and sustainable practices, which can contribute to effective climatic change adaptation and mitigation of and mitigation strategies. Today's speaker is Dr. Anand. He is a metallurgy engineer by profession, but his passion is restoration of forest. He has helped start an NGO called Junglescapes Charitable Trust in the Bantipur Tiger Reserve region. The objective of this organization was to help indigenous communities living adjacent to the forest make a better living through restoration. They started their work in the Care Reserve Forest abutting Bantipur. Anand, while being a member of the Engelscapes Committee member, prides himself in, the, in being a ground volunteer who has trekked and visited all portions of this 2,000 acre forest to understand the nature of degradation and type of interventions required. Along with Junglescape's leadership and local community members, they have focused on assisted natural degeneration, consisting of measures to improve soil hydrology, moisture retention, water availability for wildlife and removal of invasive species to revive the forest over a 14 year time period. Anand was instrumental in making this a flagship CSR program for GE, that is his employer at that time, and took the message home to other corporates to bring in additional funding. Having gained experience in this field for over 16 years, 
Dr. Anand is also a member, a board member of the Society for Ecological Restoration, Natural Regeneration Chapter, an international body working across all continents in landscape level restoration. He and his colleague, Dr. Mr. Ramesh Venkatraman, who's founder of Landscape, they run a Restoration First, a Facebook page that brings together restoration of NGOs. And Anand would like to spread the message of restoration and help more organizations engage in ecological restoration to mitigate climate change. So welcome to welcome Dr. Anand to our webinar. And uh, we are very happy that uh, you could make it. We are a very busy person, we all know, but still you found time to come and share your experiences to us for about an hour. So we welcome you on behalf of AIWC to Random Chapter. I also welcome um, our patron, Ms. Vindra Ramakrishna Pillai, uh, Usha Nair, member in charge, liaison with international agencies and NGOs, uh, Mrs. Bhuvaneshwari Ravindran, who's in charge of climatic change, uh, and other members of uh, AIWC, both. President uh, has joined Kalyani. Kalyani Raj has joined. Oh, Kalyani. Uh, Mrs. Kalyani Raj, who's the president of AIWC Delhi. I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, to our uh, webinar. I also welcome uh, the members of uh, AWC from all the branches in India and also Kerala branches. So welcome all of you and over to you, Dr. Anand. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, um, I want to first thank uh, Dr. Usha Nair, Dr. Kamini, Dr. Jamila Begum, Dr. Bhavanishri Ravindran, uh, Dr. Indra Ramakrishnan Pillai and Dr. G.B. Varghese for having um, you know, stayed in touch with me at different points and uh, basically, uh, you know, help um, uh, get this started. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, if you can see my screen. Uh, yes. Am I audible, everyone? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, so really, I was going to talk about ecological restoration, um, the role and contribution of women. Uh, but I actually wanted to place this um, in the larger perspective of uh, ecosystems in the country and uh, some of the challenges we are facing, uh, and then talk about what AIWC uh, Kerala members in particular uh, could do uh, to make a difference um, in the landscape, uh, which is Kerala. Um, I wanted to point out, you know, that apart from jungle scapes, um, we also have Society for Ecological Restoration. Uh, it's an international body uh, with members from over 80 uh, countries covering all continents uh, that actually provides um, uh, the knowledge framework uh, for us to actually operate at a, uh, at a landscape level. Uh, a lot of the academic work that goes on is in smaller plots, but SER seems to have figured out you know, how to actually uh, make ecological restoration uh, take place at a landscape level. Uh, they have partnered with the UN and the UN, given the climate change imperatives and given that we are so close to the tipping point in terms of um, uh, 450 ppm of CO2, um, they have called this the decade of uh, eco ecosystem restoration, uh, the current decade, 2021 to 2030. Uh, already, you know, we just had to keep in mind that three years have gone and we only have seven years to go to make this decade uh, really uh, uh, happen. Now, <clears throat> coming to India, um, we have carbon stock of 7,200 odd million tons of carbon. But every year we emit 3,900 million tons of carbon and it's going up. You know, when I looked up these figures five, six years ago, uh, they were at about 2,300. When I looked at it about eight, nine years ago, we were at 1600. So in less than a decade, we have more than doubled. And um, um, we are essentially emitting uh, CO2 uh, at an emissions per unit area, which is greater than that of USA, uh, which is considered an advanced uh, industrialized country. So, um, uh, you know, emissions is a major issue. Now, we all know that forests are a method to actually, uh, you know, recover back some of the emissions. Um, uh, we have done reasonably well. 
uh, 21.7% of forest cover. We've added about 0.5%. Uh, but uh, these figures actually hide a lot of data, real data. Only 55% of the forests are actually dense. Uh, more than 45% of the forests are actually open forests. And uh, about 50% of India's deemed forests are deemed as degraded. Now, taking stock of what we actually have, uh, India is one country in the world which actually has all ecosystems, almost all, you know, from evergreen, mountain sholas, <clears throat> as you would see in uh, our Eraviculum and Nilgiris, uh, moist deciduous forests, dry deciduous forests, savanna grasslands in Madhya Pradesh, for example, thorn and scrub. Uh, you will even see them in southern Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, uh, alpine meadows in Himalayas, coniferous forests, coastal mangroves, wetlands, coral reefs. We have all of them. Um, we are actually home to 70% of the world's tiger population, about 70% of the population of Asiatic elephants, uh, more than a million herbivores, uh, you know, spotted deer, samba deer, um, swamp deer, uh, gore. Um, you just take, you know, herbivores, we have them in very large numbers in the country. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, and these forests actually provide tremendous services. Uh, we call them as ecosystem services. Um, it is nature's uh, free contribution to the society. We don't pay to pay for it. We get water, topsoil is retained, uh, nutrients are better balanced, carbon capture, of course, uh, NPFP for local communities, uh, medicinal shrubs and herbs, um, preventing human wildlife conflicts, um, uh, the cultural joy we get out of a forest that we got, the aesthetic joy that we get, and the ecosystem, ecotourism services that it provides, providing livelihoods for uh, thousands of people uh, who live adjacent to forests. So this is really what uh, the forests actually give you. Uh, what I have here as a picture is actually uh, the dry deciduous stroke thorn forest that we have been restoring. Uh, this is captured two months after the rains. And you could see that uh, even now, with the forest in the background, water has been released very slowly into the streams. And you could go two months after the rainy season and see uh, you know, uh, water being available for both uh, cattle and wildlife. But we have challenges. And in our eagerness to essentially, um, you know, uh, offset greenhouse emissions on paper, um, we have been counting any green space that we can find and call them forests. Plantations are, can, are termed, deemed as forests. Uh, regions covered with exotic species like Jilly flora uh, are also deemed as forests. And um, um, our forests are actually under pressure, and which is what I want to talk about in the next couple of slides. Uh, the pressures are everywhere, and the nature of the pressure that the forests endure or go through uh, is different from different parts of the world. So plantations are endemic to Western Ghats. You know, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, uh, plantations have actually replaced uh, native forests uh, very extensively. Uh, mining continues to be a problem, uh, for example, in Goa, uh, in large chunks of Eastern Ghats, uh, you know, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha, uh, mining has a huge pressure. Quarrying is a pressure everywhere. Uh, there are people who want four-lane highways everywhere, and thankfully in Western Ghats, we have stopped it. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, we only have two-lane highways across uh, Western Ghats. Railway lines, we want to lay down new railway lines, for example, between Nilambur and Chamaraj Nagar. Uh, it goes through litigation uh, every time the Supreme Court essentially you know, stops it. Uh, but uh, that's a challenge that we've got. Cultivation, dams, uh, monocultures, invasive species. So th this last piece, which is invasive species, is so unfortunate. Because even in pristine forests, like Wayanad Tiger Reserve or... Uh, uh, um, Periyar or Mudumalai, uh, you actually get to see uh, invasive species like uh, Lantana camera. And uh, in Kerala, especially, you see Sena spectabilis coming in and taking over the forest. 
and they come in and essentially encroach into the forest, displace wildlife, displace, displace native species, uh, and degrade the forest over a period of time. And these are all species that somehow or the other are linked to human intervention and human movement into the forest. So what's the impact? <clears throat> we all know uh, Kerala has seen the brunt of it over the last few years. Uh, extreme weather. Uh, we either have droughts, as we have this year, with over 60% shortfall in rains, or floods, uh, like we, we had uh, in over the last several years in Kerala. And then we have, um, I mean, a lot of local issues like landslides, topsoil erosion, and so on that we talked about. So what is the role in all of this? I want to you know, talk about some examples. One is conserve and protect. The other is degrade, uh, restore degraded forests. Um, so with conserve and protect, uh, India has a very just a rich tradition. Uh, any other country with the same pressures that India has had in terms of population, uh, in terms of maintaining economic growth, uh, would have decimated they would have decimated all its forests. But somewhere India has actually um, had a core uh, which has a productive instinct, uh, which has been responsible for preserving at least uh, fifteen to twenty percent of uh, some of the pristine forests that we have had uh, in our country. And these traditions are, I know, um, um, uh, time immemorial, immemorial. Amrita Devi, uh, Bishna community, KGD trees, uh, back in the 1700s, when a local king wanted to cut down KGD trees um, uh, for his um, you know, needs to feed the cavalry, um, to, fee to feed um, his army, uh, Amrita Devi essentially um, I mobilized the community and stopped it. Over 300 people got killed. Uh, and we actually have a memorial for Amrita Devi and the Bishna community in Rajasthan. This is probably 300 years old. Um, in the 1970s, we all, all of us have heard about the Chipko movement and all of us talked about it. Um, uh, this happened in, um, in Uttarakhand and, um, uh, a lady called Gaura Devi, along with Chandi Prasad, but uh, they got to understand what the impact of the forest is on their uh, livelihoods, on their safety, um, on their ecosystems, and, and they literally, you know, hug the trees to essentially stop uh, them from being felled. So these are people at the ground level who actually stood up to protect the forest, and their legacy remains even today. Uh, in Kerala, we have a fantastic story. I've been following the story in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, when protecting the environment was something that I began to understand uh, as I became an adult. Um, this is a forest that actually, uh, you know, had lion tail macaques, which at that time were not seen anywhere else except in Silent Valley. It, it was also a forest without cicadas which made the valley actually silent. Uh, being located right here, uh, you know, at the southwestern corner of Nilgiris, uh, with essentially, um, you know, an 8,000 foot tall mountain range, uh, you know, in front of it. Silent Valley gets essentially insane amounts of rain, 5,000 to 8,000 millimeters of rain. And um, um, people understood what the significance of this is. And they stopped a dam from being built and they saved the Silent Valley, uh, you know, and um, and it's remained uh, with us for the past 40 years, um, you know, um, after the movement, uh, I mean, after the movement came in to essentially, you know, start a dam and had electric projects in that region, all of the kind of got stopped right there. And this has been preserved as a pristine forest. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to point out is that, um, you know, for all the extreme weather that we have seen in Idiki, uh, Silent Valley probably has received uh, 50 to 70 percent more rain than what ADK has received, and we have seen no landslides uh, in, in the Silent Valley belt. Uh, and it's largely because the rainforests have been spared and the rainforests are actually intact. So it kind of tells you what is the impact of conservation um, as far as the outcomes are concerned. Um, this uh, century, over the last decade, 
uh, Vedanta has been trying to mine essentially bauxite rich hills in Odisha. Uh, it belongs to the clone community. They worship this hill. They didn't want to see that being ravaged for uh, bauxite mining. And, um, um, you know, all said and done, uh, we are a democracy and voices do get heard. Uh, the judicial system is very aware of what needs to be done. And um, uh, the system has actually honored the community's wishes. They have respected by the nature and has been conserved. So the reason why I want to bring out these stories is that if you are beginning to see signs of uh, a precious natural resource uh, being exploited for some other purpose, um, we can stand up. And Kerala, with its very rich traditions, uh, you know, uh, can do its bit to actually protect its ecosystems. So I want to start talking about restoring degraded forests. And uh, I really want to give you the jungle scape story. Um, uh, we have many people involved uh, in, 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 uh, in all of this. Um, my uh, Ramesh Venkatraman, who founded this, uh, Mahesha and Nagendra community members, Hanuman and Satish are essentially part of the committee. Uh, between me and Satisha, we have gone and trekked almost every corner of this forest. Uh, sometimes with Ramesh, sometimes on our own, but with local community members who know this forest inside out. So we got to understand what are the issues that prevail in different sections of the forest and what needs to be done. <laughs> so it's a grassroots wildlife conservation organization focused on ecological restoration of degraded forests. Uh, before that, we were trying to start a homestay for local communities, and then we realized that there is really not uh, uh, the activity which is going to bring back the forest or create the impact because the forests there were so degraded, and we really had to do something to address that. Um, Jungle Skates works closely with the forest department and local community groups. Uh, these groups are essentially organized as village forest communities, which is what BFC is. And this began with the Japanese funding, the JICA funding, or as self-help groups, uh, which we have helped create uh, for the purpose of essentially ecological restoration. Um, in terms of location, it's right next to the Tiger Reserve. So the Tiger Reserve is all in dark green. And this located reserve forest is actually uh, in some kind of a valley, um, uh, essentially surrounded by the Tiger Reserve. And in between the Tiger Reserve, you have a pocket, which is uh, essentially partly agricultural and partly forested and, and very, very badly degraded. And as you can see here, this pocket is part of the wildlife corridor, elephant corridor. The elephants move from the Bandipur region to Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve and uh, Bihar Hills uh, in the Northeast monsoon because it rains more here in the October November time period. And then they come back here and uh, be in the Western Ghats region during the Southwest monsoon. So it's part of a migratory corridor. Uh, the elephants migrate here. Um, spillover tiger population from Bandipur comes here. Um, a lot of ungulates, you know, samba deer, spotted deer, barking deer can all be seen here. So this is really a hotspot as far as um, uh, wildlife movement is concerned. Um, what we realized was that um, uh, there was really no connect between the forest and the local community, which is constructive. So in 2007-8, what would happen is that um, we would observe that every village had about 400 to 500 heads of cattle. All those cattle will go into the forest and uh, graze and come back. People would chop, uh, you know, tree branches and essentially bring it back as firewood. And it was a very, very uh, exploitative relationship uh, uh, between the forest and uh, the local community. And, and all these heads of cattle were not just going so that they would provide milk for the families. Uh, what they would do is they would collect the excreta, the cow dung, and the goat uh, droppings, uh, make that into manure, and essentially sell that manure to coffee estates. And so you will have tractor load of you know manure going from each home to the coffee estate. And something like 40 to 50% of their income came from uh, cattle excreta, uh, which is all because of grazing inside the forest. So with this being a rain shadow region, uh, what really happened was that the rate of um, uh, ecological uh, degradation was greater than the, rate, uh, than the rate at which nature could actually repair itself. 
So that is what we tried to actually break uh, by forming these community-led organizations that would go and restore the forest. Today, we have five SSGs. Um, yeah. you know, um, so we have more, more than 50, 70 people actually working on restoration uh, throughout the year. So as I mentioned, uh, when you have so much of human pressures in the forest, um, what you have essentially are landscapes that look like this. So when we go into the forest, for example, back in 2009, I could be on the top of this hill and I could see uh, my friends actually climbing up. And um, the entire hill was actually visible everywhere because there was hardly any vegetation cover. And mostly it was because of uh, severe degradation, exposed soil, compaction of, um, um, uh, 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 of the ground. And once the ground is compacted, nothing actually grows there and inadequate tree and shrub cover, hardly any grasses. More examples of degradation, for example, in regions which are not hillsides, but actually uh, gentle slopey terrain, uh, we could see terrain like this uh, with highly compacted soil with just a few trees growing here and there. And um, also when you actually walk into this forest, uh, um, uh, you would actually see these gully channels and these gully channels are because uh, rainwater essentially travels fast down the slope because there's nothing to stop it. No grass cover, no shrub cover, no tree cover. And these channels are essentially indicative of topsoil that is lost. So if the channel is full, you actually had topsoil, but the chart, all the topsoil is actually lost because of erosion. So we had multiple problems to contend with, and uh, we tried to address them uh, you know, through different methods. I actually want to mention, you know, that um, um, we actually planted a lot of saplings and this region with about 600 to 700 millimeters of rain. Um, but, you know, uh, unlike, let's say, the north or Andhra Pradesh, temperatures here were moderate, 34, 35 degrees Celsius in summer at the most, a uh, lot of summer showers, but 600 to 700 millimeters of rain. The growth rate of these saplings is very poor and the mortality was maybe around 60 to 70%. And um, uh, the saplings are not going to essentially become a forest. We got to understand that within about two to three years. But what we did as far as saplings was concerned was we actually made it into a community activity. We gave people root trainers, we gave them seeds, we taught them how to cultivate. Um, uh, we got them to take these seedlings, put them in poly bags, got them to dig trenches, pits, and you know, plant them. So they got actually involved. And you know, the productive instincts actually came uh, to the fore right from around 2009 uh, time period. But then uh, seeing the you know, poor rate of um, uh, um, success with saplings, uh, we started getting into rainwater harvesting as a main strategy. So I'll talk to you more about you know, what the strategy is in the following slides. So we have essentially, you know, um, four types of activity as far as rainwater harvesting is concerned. First is small ponds. Um, so these ponds essentially harvest a lot of water uh, during summer, especially because the summer showers in this region are really, really heavy. Uh, the rains that you get in April and May. In fact, the April, May rains are more heavy compared to what you would get in July, August, June, July, August. And um, so uh, the water would get filled up here and this serves multiple purposes. One is that it percolates down to the vegetation around it. Uh, wildlife would come and drink water from here, but they would in turn go and spread seeds along the path they walked, uh, especially elephants and deer. And, and so you would actually see biodiversity improve uh, because of the presence of these water bodies. But our real success is actually with trenches like these. So you would see small saplings which are naturally growing. Mother Nature has already made its selection. The sapling is probably about two to three years old, maybe about you know uh, two to three feet tall. But when you start digging trenches next to it, a 15-minute shower would essentially have us a bucket load of water. And um, I you know so we had about 100,000 of these trenches made by the local community, about 100 trenches per acre. Uh, all of them have harvesting water, and that that led to recovery uh, of vegetation which was really remarkable. Uh, you know, grasses began to grow, the saplings began to grow faster, um, you know, 
the greening in this space was actually really uh, superb. And then you see stone overflows right here. Just a bunch of stones picked up from the forest and essentially placed so that uh, rainwater would come in and flow and get accumulated right here and essentially help the vegetation around it restore. And of course, chick dams uh, in streams. So these are our main uh, water harvesting strategies. So uh, apart from these, what we would do essentially is collect grasses, grass seeds from the forest and from the agricultural lands. The women would collect it. Uh, they would process them and mix them up with you know, um, goat manure and so on, make it into a small slurry or a slip and essentially go and spread it uh, in the rainy season and start improving grass cover. And once you start improving grass cover, the soil gets very nicely bound. Nutrients are actually trapped. Uh, uh, water is actually retained. And you actually get a, a lot of positive benefits out of all of this. So, um, you know, it is literally from the kitchen garden to as a forest. Uh, we had that kind of a, a, an approach uh, to essentially take care of, uh, you know, soil remediation. Uh, little stories where, uh, you know, you dig a pond. Uh, even if this pond doesn't store water, uh, retain water, it actually helps vegetation around it recover. And in a matter of four to five years, you would actually see what was a really a dry expanse uh, became actually thick woods. So a lot of stories like this. Um, this is a landscape with trenches. This is a landscape without trenches taken on the same day, uh, you know, from the same vantage point. And you could actually see what different trenches actually made to the landscape uh, during the dry season. Uh, I really want to talk about gully erosion. Um, so what we do essentially is when we see a small channel of, uh, you know, depression going through, which is essentially carrying water across, um, can this channel be essentially, uh, you know, um, stopped from, uh, you know, running away, running off the water? Can we actually somehow the other, uh, you know, harvest water in these little streams? So this is a technique we picked from an organization that is restoring mines and quarries. And so it is just a bunch of stones piled, uh, all done by women. And uh, basically, um, you know, that would essentially stop the rainwater right there, uh, harvest some seeds, recruit seeds, help vegetation grow around these gullies. And you can see that right here uh, in the forest where um, these gully plugs uh, would essentially help the vegetation recover. So these people, these women have actually gone from the stream and followed it all the way up to the hill top and seen where the water is actually coming. And across the channel, they've actually placed these stone overflows uh, at a distance where the uh, water would actually be, you know, stopped, arrested, slow down, so that the forest would actually recover. So this is done at really at scale um, in uh, about uh, three hillsides uh, in the located reserve forest. So all these measures have been um, very successful. Um, this has all been done by the women's self-help group. Uh, and all in a matter of about three to four months, they've actually done, they actually did about 130 to 140 of these gully plugs. Uh, those gully plugs remain even now um, because we go and visit the forest regularly and we can really see uh, the forest recover uh, because of some of these actions. Uh, the other thing we do essentially is remove invasive species. Uh, lantana, for example, when we remove lantana, uh, what we really allow essentially is allow grasses, shrubs, and trees to actually uh, recover the spot that actually belong to them. So in the entire located reserve forest, uh, this group of women actually have been actually removing lantana uh, by their cut through stock method, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. <coughs> so what is lantana removal? Um, lantana essentially is an invasive shrub which occupies the forest floor. You'll see them in Bandipur and Madhumalai in very large numbers. Uh, these are bushes with very small pink and yellow flowers, uh, which have berries, which are uh, you know quite tasty. So the birds love them. Uh, the butterflies pollinate them. And uh, the birds eat and disperse the seeds. And um, uh, the lantana actually spreads uh, almost like wildfire. And in the dry season, it's a huge fire risk. So the way you remove it is actually uh, by, um, you know, cutting the taproot underneath the ground. 
So what you do essentially is um, um, you basically go underneath the coping zone and um, cut the tap root uh, uh, underneath the ground, two to three inches under the ground, and just take the bush and overturn it. And once you overturn it, uh, the bush essentially dries out and dies. And because the method is so selective in that you only go to the tap root and know the, uh, and know the spot, uh, you really don't damage the forest extensively and uh, essentially um, get the forest ecosystem to actually re revive. So this is what we do uh, with what is called as a cut root start method. So you could take a landscape like this, which is full of dried out lantana, which is going to become, uh, which is going to flower and green itself and spread seeds uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the wet season uh, and remove the lantana and actually see the grasses recover and the vegetation actually grow around. And this is a space which is actually available for, uh, you know, um, uh, deer and elephants and gore, and, and obviously predators like uh, uh, tigers and leopards. Um, the heart of it is actually uh, a shovel like this, uh, which I, with which we actually remove the antenna. Um, the other invasive species we have is Cinna spectabilis. Um, uh, so this is a tree that uh, somehow got brought in as an ornamental tree uh, from South America. Um, it's, it also grows rapidly in, the, uh, in, 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 in wet climate and it's been planted as an avenue tree in, in some locations. But some of the other, it's made its way into both Wayanad uh, and uh, uh, Mudumalai to some degree, not to the same extent, and Bandipur. Um, the seeds are actually carried by um, vehicles going across. So what happens is that um, uh, the seeds get dispersed, uh, they get trapped in the tires, they get trapped underneath the chassis, uh, and essentially as the vehicle goes, uh, it disperses seeds uh, everywhere along the road. And once it takes root, it actually grows very rapidly. Uh, it's also a leguminous tree. So it fertilizes the soil in its uh, prox uh, in the proximate area, and, um, and and so when more of these land uh, the senna seeds actually uh, fall in a region infested with sen senna, the soil conditions are actually right for the uh, senna to sprout up, and it actually occupies the entire forest floor. Uh, the main problem is that the seeds are not edible, the leaves are not edible, and um, uh, it's essentially real estate with no food at all. So in Bandipur, it looks like this. Uh, large sections of the forest along the road invaded with Senna spectabilis. Uh, very dense vegetation. And when you, when you try to walk through the forest, you really can't walk through because uh, the, the trees are so dense. So we found that, you know, there is only, um, um, you know, you got to remove the flowers if you can. So we employed a lot of people to just pluck out the flowers uh, and you know, uh, ensure that these flowers don't become fruits, which become seeds. So that's one avenue that we took up. But uh, if you miss the boat and um, we come across a region which is rich in senna, which is already flowered and fruited, then we have essentially come out with different methods um, to manage senna. One is uh, approve the juvenile plants using the cut stock method, removing the seeds, the first one. Uh, if it's sour adults and adults, and they are really a dense, uh, you know, um, um, uh, they occupy the region uh, in a very, a very dense infestation. We just use the JCB to actually remove it and then remove all the root fragments, uh, exhaust all the seed banks and bring in a lot of grass and bamboo and native vegetation seeds in this region. So you can't leave it alone after you remove, you got to bring back grasses, uh, which is the first line of defense. And you also bring back nature vegetation, uh, mostly through seed dribbling. <clears throat> now, you just want to kind of remember that, you know, there are local communities living here. Um, in this 25 square kilometers, which is the uh, uh, located region, um, about five to 6,000 acres of land, agricultural land, about seven to 10 villages, uh, about... Um, thousand homes, individual homes, uh, in these 25 square kilometers. Uh, each of these homes essentially uses about um, um, four tons of firewood per year. 
So the initial method they which was used to cook was essentially just take three stones, put the logs, and essentially do the cooking and uh, heat water through the same method for bathing and so on and so forth. Uh, the firewood consumption was around 4,000 kilograms per, per home, four tons per, per home. So multiply that by about 1,000 homes, you're looking at 4,000 tons of biomass getting removed uh, every year uh, from these communities. So we realized we had to somehow the other address this. And um, around the same time, maybe in the, uh, let's say the 2015-16 time period, some of the more affluent homes began to play around with, let's have LPG stoves. So now what has happened is it has become a question of affordability. Every time you want to buy a gas cylinder, it's 1,200 rupees. And uh, really not affordable at all uh, uh, for, uh, for most people in that region. So they would use the LPG uh, stoves uh, to prepare breakfast for children so that the children essentially have something to eat before they go home, before they go to school. But all the other cooking was actually done through firewood. So we brought in an eco-friendly stove. Uh, we had initially installed it around, in around 400 houses. Here the fire is contained. Uh, the same source of fire, fire essentially heats up two vessels at the same time. And uh, the smoke and the fire are actually vented out through this chimney. And you don't have the same level of smoke inside the house. So this we found essentially reduced firewood consumption by about half. But then we began to realize that in these regions, uh, after a hard day's work, uh, most people actually like to have a bath in the evening. And, um, and bathing was a bigger consumption of firewood than food. Because for bathing, people will heat up about 100 liters of water in a large container, in a large cauldron, and just heat it up. And they would use that for bathing. So uh, we found out that there is a boiler uh, from Gujarat where you can just throw shrubs I know, small sticks and branches and essentially burn them. Uh, and it will really heat up about 30 liters of water in about 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, it's a very nice design. Um, we actually did this work uh, in our field station, established what the improvement is in terms of firewood consumption. And we found that we could re reduce under 1,500 to 2,000 kilograms of firewood uh, per boiler. So now we have you know, uh, distributed this to over 1,000 homes um in the um uh, bandipur region so these small measures that we have taken uh covering each home essentially has reduced fiber consumption by about 80 percent and um uh, and i am really hoping that in the next few years we'll actually begin to see um, a huge improvement in green cover uh, because um uh, firewood, which is still one source of interaction between the community and the forest, actually gets reduced. So, what is the impact? So, very, very astounding stories. I got pictures that go to 2023, but uh, you know, uh, these are story, you know, pictures that I would so show typically, and uh, very huge improvement in green cover uh, because of our, uh, you know, involvement in this region. Um, Quite often when you walk into the forest, it actually looks like this. And I really like this picture because the grass cover is about, uh, you know, knee height to waist high in many locations. Uh, it's a very rich, uh, biodiverse region because you have trees, you have shrubs. Uh, many of them are edible. Uh, and this is a kind of a landscape which both uh, deer and uh, elephants uh, would love to kind of navigate through and essentially eat. Uh, we see elephants throughout the year. I mean, there was a time in 2009 that the only time that you would see elephants was in November when they migrate to Eastern Ghats. But now you can see elephants both in the dry season and the monsoon season. And um, uh, excellent uh, habitat now for elephants. Uh, I've walked in the forest and I've seen evidence of uh, deer kill, uh, either by a tiger or a, uh, or a leopard. Uh, and this is something that is very common. We actually see animal kills in our forest. Um, uh, almost any time I go, I, we would actually see park marks uh, in some of the paths that we walk, uh, subtle tiger, uh, leopard, uh, and certainly some are deer. Um, so we know that what we have done essentially has been uh, very successful um, in terms of improving um, you know, the ecosystem, uh, in terms of providing livelihood for 70 families 
they pretty much come every day and uh, work for jungle scapes um you know except for wednesday which is kind of given as a day off they wanted to have one week day off uh, for them to do other things but uh, they work six days a week and essentially get paid really well i mean this is not something they would readily get uh, through casual labor in a farm uh, because it's very sporadic in nature and not something they can bank on so uh, that's the difference that we have made so now how is all of this applicable in kerala uh, what are the challenges in kerala so if you actually take a look at the map uh, kerala has probably got about 56% green cover but only 29% is actually forest and uh, if you start taking a look at uh, the forest you actually have um, quite a bit of plantations all these purple ones are all plantations um and then you have evergreen forests like in Peria, Tekeri, Agastya Mala region, Salent Valley. These are the belts where you have actually uh, evergreen and semi evergreen forests. But a lot of this is actually moist deciduous. Uh, and then you have a lot of forest plantations. You see a lot more of them in Tamil Nadu, uh, like eucalyptus and uh, pine. Uh, but you also have some in Kerala, uh, which are essentially forest plantations. And these don't harvest the same amount of water. Uh, these don't bind the soil in the same level uh, to the same degree as what you would see in a rainforest, like in an evergreen or a semi evergreen forest. Um, so, you really have two issues in Kerala. Uh, one essentially is that you have landslides and floods uh, after extreme weather events. And um, when you start taking a look at where these landslides actually took place, you would see that it actually maps really well to where you have plantations. Uh, you have significant spread of invasive species in forested regions. So, for example, you take Vyanad. Uh, we hear of uh, a lot of you know human uh, wildlife conflicts in the Vyanad belt. Um, both tiger uh, movement has become very high outside the forest. I mean, uh, elephants have always been a problem outside the forest, and um, so we've had those kind of issues come up as far as um, Kerala is concerned. Um, so the question is, what can we do about this? Um, if you were to kind of prioritize, I would say that the lowest hanging fruit is addressing the presence of invasive species. Um, uh, even now we have, uh, you know, a shortage of, um, you know, work um, for people uh, at different times of the year. Um, and AIWC is a very influential chapter. If you can work with the government and essentially have an MNRG and effort, uh, mobilize, you know, centered around managing invasive species, especially Sinna spectabilis, um, what you would see is that the quality of the forest in Vinard would improve quite a bit. And once the quality of the forest improves in Vinard, you would see far less conflicts uh, in the peripheral regions of Vinard. And um, this would be a, a great improvement for the forest. Uh, this would be a great improvement as far as carbon sequestered is concerned, uh, a great improvement as far as uh, ecosystem services is concerned, because the Senna essentially sucks up all the water, but having native vegetation would help you in better control release of water, um, you know, the, the rainwater. So Senna would be a big priority. Um, now, Kerala is a you know, in many ways, at the grassroots level, um, uh, quite an affluent state. Uh, but you still have, um, you know, um, native communities which are living in very remote regions uh, under difficult conditions. Um, uh, addressing firewood, uh, reducing firewood dependence would go a long way because that is the main source of conflict with wildlife. People go into the forest to actually uh, collect firewood. And they get in, and they come across elephants, gaur, uh, and, and you know tiger and leopards, uh, which is when uh, a lot of the conflict happens. So, you know, providing them uh, with um, uh, cook stoves, with boilers, uh, which essentially consume far less firewood, which can even work with small branches and twigs, uh, would be very helpful because um, a the ecosystem is preserved inside the forest, and b the probability of conflict that they would have with wildlife reduces quite a bit because they don't have to go to the forest on a daily basis uh, to meet their essential requirements. Um, 
plantations are a huge um, story. Um, uh, both in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, it's become a very um, a big industry. Uh, we have to respect the fact that it provides jobs. We have to respect the fact that, um, you know, a large number of people make livelihoods out of all of this. And we all have a tea and coffee and pepper, uh, which have become an essential part of our daily lives. But is there something that could be done to actually, um, you know, uh, mitigate the situation, remedy the situation and make it a bit better? So here is a picture of a tea estate with silver oak as canopy trees. Now, silver oak is an exotic species. Uh, it does not have the same carbon sequestration as, let's say, a rainforest tree or, uh, uh, or a shola species. Um, or, uh, you know, can we actually plant shola species right here instead of silver oak, native species instead of silver oak, or even create small pockets of sholas in the tea estate? Uh, and you can see some of those examples in Munnar. Uh, the higher elevations are essentially have sholas, and the lower elevations actually have tea estates. Uh, can we start? you know, remedying the landscape in, a, in, in different ways so that water availability, water storage, carbon sequestered all improves. And the same thing goes with um, coffee estates where um, silver oak trees are essentially are, you know, planted densely. Um, they essentially don't have much of a spread. Um, the carbon sequester is much lower. These are exotic species. Uh, and you begin to see in Wayanad in portions of um, uh, Karnataka and Kurg, a lot of these silver oaks have given way to essentially um, uh, evergreen trees, uh, which may have other uses. You know, they may have, you know, fruits which are useful, seeds which are useful, uh, like some of the ficus species that go into making profula. So, can you somehow create a hybrid where you actually have rainforest trees along with coffee bushes? So, these are all examples of you know changes that we can bring about. Um, uh, in these plantations that actually make a difference. Now, what's the role of women in all of this? So when we talk about these interventions, these need to take place at a huge scale. So because you're looking at, you know, thousands of acres of plantations um, um, uh, in the Western Ghats. And, and so you really need, you know, literally thousands of trees to make this happen. So where is a seed bank? Where is a nursery? Uh, where do we have capacity for all of this? Can all of this be somehow democratized along with the forest department? Where instead of forest department having a 10 acre nursery, we actually have kitchen gardens um, that actually serve as nurseries. Uh, let these kitchen gardens be handled by people who are poor, who are looking for income, who could actually, you know, um, um, who could actually sell these saplings to estates and who could actually sell these saplings to the forest department and, and really have a scenario where this whole restoration actually gets democratized. So these are some opportunities that I really wanted to highlight uh, on this space. And then where possible, <clears throat> um, uh, leveraging assisted natural regeneration and other hybrid methods to restore degraded lands. So in junglescapes, a lot of work that we did is only trenches. We didn't really plant too much. We did plant before, but we found that that was not the most effective. So you have rainwater harvesting trenches, uh, you know, to take care of things, especially in the dry season, start dribbling seeds in those trenches. Uh, so, you know, both grasses and native trees, uh, eliminate weeds, and you actually see the forest actually recover. And this is a, look, a method which is actually very cost effective. You can cover very large areas. And uh, as you have seen from jungle scapes, uh, women can lead the way and essentially drive these restoration efforts really, really well. So, uh, when you talk about ecological restoration covering thousands of acres, um, to me, uh, from whatever I can see, uh, the biggest challenge is A, what to do, and B, how do we build capacity? So we have to build capacity, which means we need to have all these capabilities at source. Um, you want to do you know, evergreen trees, you need you know, sacks and sacks of seeds uh, to cover these acres. So seed collection and processing uh, needs to essentially take place. And the processing can be done at home. You can actually, you know, soak the seeds in hot water, in, uh, in humic acid, which is essentially manure. There are, you know, protocols available for different types of seeds, uh, which are, you know, very readily 
you know, uh, obtained from the net, from the internet. Biodiversity nursery for indigenous, you know, forest species. I mean, the goal should be every kitchen garden which wants to participate should be a source of, you know, evergreen trees. Um, form a group which is capable of removing invasive species. So you have a team which actually is capable of removing invasive species like um, uh, Sena Spectabilis in Kerala. You actually have role models in Kerala done by women. So I actually have, you know, interacted with Meera Rajesh. Uh, she runs an, uh, uh, an NGO called Forest First Samiti. Uh, she operates in both Vainar and Coorg. And she, along with the local communities, have single-handedly restored, you know, hundreds of acres of you know, plantations and brought back uh, evergreen species. So you actually have people that you can go to and get this done. Uh, there is also an organization called Gurukala Botanical Sanctuary in Vainar, uh, run by uh, Dr. Suprabha Seshan. Uh, she also can essentially provide training to people um, and show how it is done. So you could actually go and visit her place and see how it's all done and start some of these activities. So lastly, uh, where does funding come from? I mean, it's a very real challenge and we cannot, you know, um, and ignore this altogether. So the first thing that I would really say is that CSR has got a very valuable role to play in all of this. CSR. Uh, in Kerala means both industries and eco uh, and you know um, uh, tourist complexes. All the resorts which are doing so well in Kerala, uh, they could all be uh, part of a CSR initiative that actually reverse restores forests, uh, converts plantations into rainforests. Carbon funding, uh, we are just beginning to see how this is all possible. Uh, I am already in touch with some carbon funding agencies. We're trying to start a pilot in Nilgiris uh, for something like this. Um, the math is very simple. Each hectare of a rainforest harvests about 600 tons of carbon. And for each ton of CO2 that is sequestered, uh, you get about uh, $14, about um, uh, close to 1,000 rupees. So 600 tons multiplied by 1,000 rupees essentially is about 6 lakh rupees a hectare is what you can actually get through carbon sequestration. And this money gets you know, distributed as the forest actually gets uh, you know, recovers. More often than you're going to find out that the profitability of estates is actually very poor. And uh, the money that you can make through carbon uh, economy is actually comparable to that of uh, CSR uh, to, through carbon funding. And then you have company organizations like AERF and Pune, uh, Applied Ecological Research Foundation, uh, who have in incentivized local communities into conserving forests and essentially saying, if this forest is in your land, uh, for this acre of forest, I'm going to get you X amount of money. And they essentially go through a crowdsourcing model, get money from across the world, and essentially incentivize conservation of forests. Lastly, and not the least, lastly, and not the least, this is our investment. This is your investment. Because when you bring back native biodiversity, and you, when you bring back the forest cover, the ecosystem services that it provides uh, you know, pays back many times over. So in some ways, if we do not act, uh, this is what we're going to see uh, uh, across our regions in different forms, uh, landslides, floods, and drought. But if we do act, uh, we are actually going to start creating uh, a very biodiverse um, a complex, uh, which is capable of, you know, harvesting carbon, uh, storing water, uh, managing wildlife, uh, and all of that. So this picture is actually from Kerala in the Idiki region. This picture is something that I shot from, um, from Periyar uh, when, when we went on, went on a trek uh, in the Periyar Tiger Reserve uh, towards the lake. So this is a vial. These are bamboos. Uh, these are a moist uh, deciduous trees. And um, I know a fantastic complex, which is capable of supporting elephants, deer, tiger, and you know all the wildlife and essentially, you know, make our environment uh, all clean and really good. So this is where I would leave you with. Uh, this is actually uh, God's own country. And uh, all of India is, you know, God's own country. And uh, I really hope that uh, all of us play a role in uh, ecosystem restoration. And uh, the women especially have a role to play because that's really where, uh, you know, they bring in capacity and scale if um, every home begins to participate.
thank you. I want to leave you with um, this thank you slide uh, and also acknowledgement from um, um, our funding partners which are, who have actually made this possible. And um, also our knowledge partners, A3 Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, uh, Center for Ecological Managing, Management of Degraded Ecosystems in Delhi, which have helped us out on um, uh, Lantana management, uh, Karnataka Forest Department for being uh, so good uh, in uh, you know, uh, giving us the time and space to get this done. Thank you, Dr. Anand, uh, for your wonderful presentation on restoration of forest and what part women can play in such a restoration. Thank you so much. Now, any questions can be addressed to by Dr. Anand? Any doubts you have? Anybody can address your doubts. Before that, sir, can you stop sharing? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Kalyani is there. She, you can ask her to say a few words. Is she uh, there? Thank you. Thank you, Usha. And uh, thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti, for a wonderful presentation. Um, it was so detailed and uh, very informative. And uh, of course, I was very happy also that uh, some of the solutions which you were mentioning, uh, our branch uh, members are already into that. But there is a lot more which we can do. Uh, what I can gather from your presentation and I'm sure our members from Kerala will be in touch with you. But um, uh, yeah, it was really quite uh, uh, knowledge enhancing your presentation and it was very good and very relevant to what we can actually do. And they were also what the solutions suggested by you were also not very difficult. They were all very doable one. And I'm sure we can take uh, there's a lot of takeaways and uh, we will be in touch with you definitely to take this forward. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks you, so Kalani ji. Thank you. I think Baishali Dutt has, she wants to ask something. Baishali, ma'am. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Ah. Sir, Krishnamurti, sir, I had been to your God's own country like Kerala, 90% of the place. Uh, just one thing I want to know. Uh, yes, it is so very green and everything. I understood now how it had become, what hard work it had gone through. But uh, what, uh, how actually that Gujarat boiler work? Means how it. Sure. It's, it's very. It's actually very it's similar to the boilers we had, you know, in the uh, when we were growing up. Uh, it's, it's this is a steel boiler, and uh, so you have uh, a base where you actually throw in firewood, etc. And uh, and so the fire the fire starts burning, and it's taken out through a chimney just like a conventional boiler, and the water is around it. The only difference that I would really see is that the um, uh, in the conventional boiler you would actually have a tap which is right above the fire, so it's quite yeah. you know a, a task to open the tap. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in this one, what they would do essentially is have a spout on the side. So once you fill up thirty liters and it becomes hot. They just pour, you know, mugfuls of water from the side, and you'll actually get the spillover really hot water from the from the other side. That's really all there is to it. But it's really the design where the surface area of the chimney to the volume of water is actually optimized in such a way that in a very short period of time, uh, with small branches, you could actually get uh, to the temperatures that are required for bathing. Thank you so very much, sir. I was like, uh, how it works. Thank you so very much. Now I understood. I got it. Thank sure. you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else would like to share any experience or ask for doubts? Clear your doubts. Yeah, I would just uh, like to mention something. Uh, that Kalyani, as Kalyani said, we have we are already working in some of these areas. One of these is uh, uh, smokeless uh, cook stoves. That is exactly for the uh, uh, for uh, reducing uh, fuel consumption. Uh, uh, because as uh, in the climate change conferences, you can see that all the countries are calling for phasing out uh, 
uh, the, these fuels, but uh, India has taken the stand that we cannot phase out, but we will only phase down. Uh, so that way, what we are trying to achieve here is to reduce the consumption of wood so that uh, less forests are cut and less uh, forests are degraded. So that is one thing uh, that uh, awareness about uh, these towns and uh, also construction of uh, these towns in uh, poor homes. That is something that we are already doing. And then uh, the other one is introduction of alternate uh, energy, solar energy. Uh, we are trying to popularize uh, solar energy and uh, uh, make solar cooking popular among uh, 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 households. So that is another area where we are already working. But uh, the forest that I don't think we are doing much work in uh, forest because one thing is at least in Kerala, we don't have too many branches uh, near forest areas, but uh, we'll try to see what we can do. Like uh, that nursery is a very doable thing, I think. And another one is organic vegetable farming. We are already popularizing and we have taken up projects on uh, organic vegetable farming. Uh, so there also we can... Uh, integrate this into that into that project and we'll be able to do something i hope so so uh, dr krishnamurti will be in touch with you for your guidance and assistance and we'll also see uh, what we can do with jungle scapes uh, we will uh, visit i have already visited your website we'll go through it more thoroughly and see how we can uh, take your help in doing something at least for uh, restoration of ecology in the forest areas. Yeah. Thank you. Know, you for to me, the biggest um, you know, applicability from jungle scapes to Kerala would be in managing Sinha Spectabilis. So um, we'll try, if you, if you can plan this out in advance, we'll kind of take you to a site where we had Sinha and we'll talk about how we had them removed and what did we do after the Sinha removal uh, to bring back native forests. Uh, that would be very good. I, I also wanted to point out, you know, that if you Google Kriti Karan, um, she's essentially trying to brand a uh, Kadu coffee. So essentially what she's trying to do is incentivize estates which have rainforest trees instead of silver oak trees. So that one simple, you know, intervention, which is uh, to slowly start replacing uh, silver oak with, uh, with uh, rainforest trees uh, so that uh, you still get the shade for the coffee bushes, but the tree canopy is all rainforest. That makes a huge difference, both in terms of carbon stored, uh, rainwater runoffs, and also, you know, providing a better home for wildlife, you know, all the way from, you know, uh, the hornbills to uh, Malabar squirrels, uh, you know, um, all of them benefit from having uh, a, a real tree instead of a silver oak, uh, you know, plantation. Shika Mitra has raised her hand. Can Shika, Shika Mitra has raised her hand. Okay. Shika, ma'am. Shika, ma'am. Are you there? Maybe some uh, problem with the network. Maybe. Yeah. Bhuneshwari, would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, today's uh, this session, Dr. Anand, it was very educative. Actually, um, we go and see the forest and wildlife and all that. This is the first time that we are seeing, you know, restoration of forest and how, what a hard work it is. Uh, yes. Actually, and uh, in that, the role of women also in that. It was, yeah. uh, your presentation was really great. And uh, we are, by doing this restoration, we are giving it back to the nature and, of course, preserving the ecology. And uh, one thing I want to do, I, uh, whenever we had these sort of webinars or whenever we read, women are the ones who are bearing all the brands of any environmental degradation, whether it is floods or whether any disaster or anything. Because for them, the family comes first. It's not uh, like uh, men don't, yeah, this thing, but for women it is more, and so and when there's a water shortage, it is the women who bring water yeah. from such uh, far away places and such things. You know, we see in villages. So on the same coin, women should also play a major role. 
uh, in the in uh, these sort of activities. Yeah. It's very nice to see the in the community. Uh, what I saw was in 2007, the photograph we saw, and after four or five years, literally you are uh, planting the grass. All these things are really uh, very nice to see and encourage you. And yeah. um, that's what uh, uh, really amazing work you are doing and uh, very new to us. Yeah, that's all. Thank you, Bhuneshwari. I, I have one question ah, yes. about this um, uh, tree. You said no about Lantana and Sena, etc. Uh, taking it out. So what sort of a tree you will be encouraging to grow in the forest? Yeah, so actually, you know, we've been very respectful uh, 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 in that these forests are essentially self-organized ecosystems. You know, Mother Nature, you know, somehow arranged uh, niches where, you know, different species grow at the right locations. So we didn't want to just go and plant something at random uh, and create an artificial forest. Uh, what we learned was that the first line of defense is actually grasses. So once you get the grass cover back, uh, then the microbial activity in the soil starts and it becomes possible for other seeds to germinate and derive nutrition and actually grow. So grass cover, so we would actually observe that landscape after removal of lantana if there was no native vegetation underneath and if there was no grass cover underneath, then we would bring in grass cover and maybe bring back, uh, you know, maybe bamboo and a few other species which are native to the region. So if that region had a lot of, let's say, what we would call as bejalu, um, uh, which is a short tree in the Bandipur Tiger Reserve. Uh, I don't want to bombard you with botanical names, but uh, the elephants like uh, the bark of that particular tree. Um, so we would go and plant bejalu, or we would go and disperse cassia fistula seeds, which are essentially what is called as kake in Canada and sharakondra in Tamil. Uh, and the pods of the Casa is something that is liked by both uh, uh, monkeys and bear. So we would have that kind of a rationale, but more often than not, if the landscape is actually okay after lantern removal in terms of presence of native grasses and some young saplings growing underneath, we would leave the landscape alone. So the correct answer would be leave it alone is one, uh, you know, maybe 60, 70% of the time bring back grass cover and bring back bamboo would be the second reason. And bamboo is something which you're very partial towards for one major reason. You know, Bandipur had a lot of lamp bamboo and bamboo unfortunately has this habit of flowering, dispersing seeds and dying off every 30, 40 years. So every 30, 40 years, it'll disperse seeds and die immediately. Now, the last time it germinated and grew was maybe in the 1980s when uh, we didn't have so much of lantana. Now, 40 years later, it actually reproduces, disperses seeds, and the ground is full of lantana, and, and the bamboo seeds struggle to take root in a lantana-covered region. And, you know, absence of lantana means inadequate food for, for elephants, and that essentially means a more human-wildlife conflicts down the road. So we really wanted to address that. So bamboo is something that we have really brought back very successfully. Uh, it's really nice to see over the last four or five years several clumps of bamboo, all growing to a height of maybe shoulder height and so on and so forth right now. But you come back in about four or five years and you're going to find these as um, um, dense bamboo clumps, which are actually visible uh, as you drive along. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's a change that I think uh, you would actually get to see in Bandipur. Um, but the short answer is grasses and bamboo or do nothing. Bamboos um, help in uh, water cons uh, Absolutely. consumption also. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Chika, can I, can, I can I say something? Sure. Is it Chika? Hello, is it Chika, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Can I can I ask some question to ah, Sure, Shikha sure, sure, sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to that I'm here uh, with all of you, especially what he said today uh, with his presentation, it is very informative and everything. But one question is, you have whatever you have told related to Kerala, Karnataka, and all those areas. But what about the eastern part? Because I belong to the West Bengal. 
and especially we are facing some problems in the western sub district in the western part of west bengal the wildlife especially elephants deer leopards they are coming to the people where people are living and because of this afforestation of uh, this uh, forest in the hill areas and the jungles so they are coming to the people where they are, people are residing so this is a very great problem and do you have any idea that any organization like yours are working in the west bengal to solve this problem or so that we can contact them on behalf of awc sure actually there is a lady called diya banerji um and um uh, what i will do is i'll kind of get you her coordinates uh, through dr kamini um uh, but diya has uh, diya and i have been in touch uh, and she wanted to know more about what we have done in jungle scapes and we gave uh, a talk but she is actually operating in the same region that you talked about this is the eastern portion of west bengal uh, bordering jharkhand uh, where you have uh, forests which are degraded yeah and, i'm talking and- about the west bengal yeah part of the jharkhand border bakura purulia yes yes, yes. Uh, so dia banerji is somebody that you should talk to um and see as to how you can help her but to me the template is very is, is similar um it, you would first start with assisted natural regeneration so what happens is when you go into a forest which is degraded uh it's not like you're going to see zero saplings which are growing there you're going to see saplings which are actually small uh, a few trees which are of shoulder high uh, very few trees which are actually tall but if you start helping the trees which are about you know knee high waist high to grow faster uh, through water harvesting trenches uh, that makes all the difference so um, these trenches essentially harvest water like the photograph i showed uh, you know of the trench filled with water i still remember it so well it was a 15 minute shower and we were all in a school in the lokere village um we just wanted to see how the trenches did because we knew the trenches were done very recently so we so we all somehow got into a vehicle ran and then literally ran up the forest to the region where the trenches were and we could see that uh many of these trenches were actually had harvested all the water i mean more than a bucket full of water in within about 10 to 15 minutes of rain so the trenches make such a huge difference in harvesting water where it matters i mean you you dig a trench at random next to any juvenile sapling that is growing and uh, that essentially makes such a huge difference uh, the other difference that you could think that you could do is essentially contour trenches which are longer uh, but are in the same level ground so wherever you have water coming in from a slope it distributes itself along the trench and as long as you ensure that the trench does not disturb native vegetation does not you don't kind of chop away a young sapling to dig a trench you want to find that there is actually going to have a huge impact on essentially restoration of the forest so assisted natural regeneration wherein you remove the obstacles that come in the way of growth removal of invasive species and uh, improve water availability moisture availability um improve nutrient availability to grasses just these three things make such a huge difference so if Uh, a funding model can be found wherein local communities engage get engaged in all of this uh, and they get their livelihoods uh, you're going to find that this is going to do work for you for many years to come in terms of restoring the forest thank you thank you thank you uh, but diya banerji is a person okay if you give the phone number to usha ma'am or me yeah. we'll pass it on to ishika ma'am yeah thank you dr anand also mention two ladies in kerala you can share their contacts also sure i'll do that ah, thank you thank you so yeah. much any other questions by shali dath has also raised uh, uh, am i allowed to ask another question to sir yeah, sure uh, okay uh, so actually i want to know is there any kind of grass which can be uh, taken maybe not a natural vegetable uh, grass of that particular zone but can be taken and planted like ma'am was talking about i actually trek on purulia 
uh, jungles and all that uh, area hill areas they are very barren and rugged and uh, they they don't have exactly they have small small shrubs but uh, not exactly you know what we call as grass so is there any kind of grass which can be taken because i go i can give or we uh, from aiwc can organize something to give is it possible is there any kind See, of grass it's, can it's, be taken uh, if it's from a similar uh, let's say uh, ecosystem so let's say uh, i'll give you an example uh, i mean uh, uh, which part of the country are you in ma'am uh, i'm from west bengal purulia i'm talking about basically i trek uh, in the purulia it's very rugged as shikha ma'am was telling absolutely correctly sure so, so, so anything in the belt also, right yeah. in the purulia belt in the chota nagpur belt yeah. uh, jharkhand west bengal belt border belt you could you could pick grasses from regions which are uh, a um, uh, same geographical location yeah. and b similar terrain if it's a slopey terrain slopey terrain slopey if it's terrain. level terrain level terrain and okay. as long as these are uh, native grasses you could really try it out ma'am okay it is based to use the native grasses as you are yeah, mentioned yeah yeah so thank you sir thank you very much for allowing me to ask second question thank you thank you ma'am ah uh, mrs sarama chandi wants to ask you something ma'am ask the question please unmute yourself yeah uh, good evening sir it was a very excellent talk and very informative i just want to ask one question when you select plants uh, selection of plants is it related to the purification of air certain plants purify air much more than the other plants that is what uh, the theory says especially neem tree so do you have any such selection in uh, vegetation of the terrain area such selection are you considering sir uh ma'am you know um since the what work that we've been doing recently is in a forest ma'am uh what we have tried to do is to bring back uh species which are uh you know native to the forest uh, and as i mentioned um we spend more efforts in essentially assisting native vegetation to grow faster uh rather than plant new species Uh, because we found that the the planting of new species is not very successful uh, in terms of slow growth rates and mortality in a rain shadow belt like Bandipur. Now, a, 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 I mean, the answer would not be the same if I were to kind of talk about, let's say, Kerala, where uh, you know, uh, whatever you plant has got a much better chance of you know taking root and growing and so on and so forth. But uh if it's in a forest i would not really alter the composition of the forest i would try to keep the composition of the forest uh what it should be um that's the answer but uh, obviously if you're going to do this in a tea estate or a coffee estate then uh you have more latitude uh in terms of the kind of vegetation you want to bring uh the only um you know humble suggestion i would make is that whatever we plant should be native to the region but purification and this has no relation no uh, that point is not considering while selecting the plant air purification we can madam certainly in in a tea estate coffee estate we should consider those things uh, and we should bring a uh, a uh, uh, a good balance yes okay thank you sir thank you ma'am any other question so can we wind up or what actually dr anand we had done our network is not on uh, focused chula so we can't hear her it's very popular among the rural women in trivandrum so years back yes. now everybody has lpg connection so the women make use of these uh, lpg and they have smokeless chula and they cut the uh, the wood into small 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 bits and use it for cooking so there is not much smoking also because of that Oh, that's a very valuable point. Yeah. Small branch is giving you less smoke than ah, a big. Ah, less smoke and it's that's it's a, that's a very such a way that hot air rises. Yeah. So they have a chimney. It is the 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 chula is designed in such a way that hot air rises up. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it goes through the chimney outside. Doesn't come into the 
house. This is the so house, right. It helps the women also. I think that's all. Now, Usha, can we wind up? Usha? Usha? I think she's muted, I think. Uh, no, I think some network issue, I believe. Oh, no. Uh, Randa uh, instrumentally, she is there. Uh, she's not there, I think. I'll, I'll call her. Oh, no. Yeah, I, think, I think it's okay. Her. I think it's okay. Ah, she's come back. Usha, can we wind up? No, she didn't hear. She didn't hear. Uh, should I call? No, she's calling, I think. She's calling. Uh, she's calling. Uh, what is it about? Uh, Usha ji, connection for you. Hello? Uh, Usha ji, connection for you. Ah. Uh. Uh, Aap, Allah, uh, the uh, session, uh, question, answer, everything is over. Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, now we can hear uh, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can hear you. Actually, yeah, there is a message from Baishali that this is a, such an engaging session. Loved every bit of it. Very nice. <laughs> that was and nice. Anything more in the chat you can read out, Kamini? Yeah, that, that's only one. And Lata Mohan has said, well said, sir. Well said. And Baishali, uh, that thanks Dr. Anand for such an engaging session. Thank you, Baishali Ji. Can you, wind, can you wind up, Usha? Yes, Kamni, I think you go ahead. My network is not good. Okay. So, yeah, okay. please. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anand for taking time to be with us for more than an hour. And uh, it was really a very interesting session, something which we have not listened to earlier. We have not even thought about that, but it's a very, very nice uh, topic and such a lot of good work you're doing, Dr. Anand. So thank you so much for being here. I would like to thank uh, Kalyani Ji for her presence here and the member, all the members of AWC uh, in all other branches and also uh, Kerala. I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Ramakshina Pillai, auntie. She's a patron uh, for giving us, for helping us to arrange this session. And also our president, uh, Jalaji Gumari Jeechi and the secretary, Dr. Zivi Vargis, for their presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I want to Jonathan. thank AWC thank again for so giving much. me the opportunity. Uh, uh -huh. You know, it's really nice to, uh, you know, first of all, spend some time pulling these slides together because that's when you really start thinking more and more. Yeah, and thank every you, time Dr. you do it, it's very useful. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity given. Uh, very humbled. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Usha. I, didn't, I forgot to thank you. Thank you, you so thank much. You also, and Usha. I also thank all of you for attending. Uh, our patron, Bina Jane, was also there. I oh. want to especially yeah. thank her also. Uh -huh. And uh, thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti, for that uh, wonderful session, uh, which gave us uh, new insights into this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you. Dr. Anand. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Ushaji, you can end the session. Ushaji? Hello? Uh, Ushaji, uh, session end the idea. Ah, uh, kainu kainu. Other, uh, we believe it liya. Usha ji, endi it liya. Okay. Liya, still on, still on.
അത് കാരണം ഞാൻ ആ വാഞ്ഞത് ഐ സ്റ്റിൽ ലോൺ ലൈവ് ഓക്കെ 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 ഞാൻ ലീവായി നോക്കാം 